Uh, hello, everyone. In case you are, like me, having a little trouble remembering or keeping track, it's Thursday, April 23rd. And for those of you who care, tonight will be the start of the new moon. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, and see everyone today. It's been another fantastic week of lunchtime new social environment talks, hearing from Stanley Whitney about his art and love of jazz, feeling the love and inspiration from the great Peter Brook and his reverence for the Mahar, 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 Mahar Bharata. And yesterday, Earth Day, environmental artist Lauren Bond discussed ideas about nature, life species, and all our connections, which was truly impactful. So I had a conversation with Fong last night and we discussed the Buddha's journey for about three minutes. How did he start? What inspired him? How does one become grounded and centered? Uh, this was just a very quick discussion and we were, I was wondering at the end, uh, does one need a Bodhi tree? Um, I'm not sure how much all of this we'll get a chance to discuss, but I am delighted that we will have the opportunity to get to know more about our featured guest artist. Min Jung Kim was born in Gwangju, Korea and studied calligraphy and ink painting at the Hongik University in Seoul, where she received her master's. And in 1991, she furthered her studies when she left Korea for Europe, where she studied at the Brera Academy in Milan where she expanded her art historical canon to the Western experience and wrote about the spiritualism of ink. Uh, most recently, Min Jung has had international solo shows um, at the Langen Foundation in Neuss, Germany, and the Guangzhou Museum of Art in Korea. And uh, Min Jung, your work is also included in a number of public, international public collections, including the British Museum in London and the Asia Society in New York. Hello, Min Jung. Yes. Hi. How are you? How are you doing? I'm, I'm fine, a little bit nervous, and everything is so fine, yeah. <laughs> Please don't be nervous. We, you've done lots of these before. I've seen you, and you've been marvelous. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where you are zooming us from, zooming from? Because I last saw you in New York, and I know you've recently left. Tell us a little bit about where you are. Yeah, at the moment I'm in Saint Paul de Vence, uh, from near Nice, in 15 minutes by car, where very famous for the Fondation Meg and the very famous restaurant Colombe d'Or, and it's a very well known place for the art people and I'm just on the little town of the, this uh, the town and the, with a nice garden now is I feel full of spring here 20 degrees yeah. 20 degrees Celsius I know yes. um, I know that during this period of the pandemic that if you measure Celsius I know this from Tom Hanks our temperature is supposed to be 34 36 i don't know what 20 degrees celsius is is that warm enough for you very warm yeah warm, yes. let's see your pictures from um where you are if you don't mind let's see something about your garden and some of the nature and the beautiful scenery that you enjoy yeah when i come back i have a bad news because the fox came they eat three chickens so i was a little bit sad so now i have only two but tomorrow there will be another three kitchen will come one white color one black one brown so i'm so right now for... we're looking at your garden and i see some trees um catherine can we move forward because i know that uh, min jung is also an avid gardener are there any pictures of some of the other plants that she grooms? Oh, wait. There's Min Jun's dog at the lower left corner. Yeah. Um, anything else? Uh, Catherine, let's move forward to, is there a garden shot? One more forward, maybe? No? Well, Min Jung, you mentioned your chickens, and I know we have a video of that. Um, <laughs> is there, can we show everybody Min Jung's very lively chicken farm? <laughs> So 
So Min Jung, you've had chickens for a while. This isn't something you've just started during this very stressful time. You've had fresh eggs all the time, right? Yes, yes. This year I got, uh, uh, from last year I got the chicken and the chicken is very regularly. They make nice eggs and uh, we have so many eggs every day. Yeah. So you're eating a lot of uh, quiches and frittatas, I imagine, where you are? And, yes, uh, I ate all kind of egg. Yes, a lot of egg food, egg dish I make it, yeah. Sounds great. Your chickens seem very happy. And I know yeah. you grow your own vegetables. So this is something that you've been doing. It's part of your lifestyle. It's not something that you are just starting. So um, good for you. I'm so, uh, we're all so happy to live vicariously through your experience. Is there something that you can share with us about this time of growth and planting and enjoying your fresh eggs? Yes, this time now uh, there is a strawberry because last year I took it from the mother strawberry. I took a small baby strawberries and I put the pot and the whole the winter time. Now I put uh, all the vases uh, and they are starting to having strawberries. So I'm waiting for they became a red ripe. It's so relaxing to care them. It's, it sounds fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. We all wish we were there. So just to continue about where you are, you have just left New York a little less than a week ago. You've yeah. lived in Korea for a lot of your life. And I know you've also lived at various times in Europe and um, other parts of the world. Um, where does it feel most like home for you? At the moment, I feel here, St. Paul de Vence, because the green is so entertaining and I feel home here. Of course, I don't speak good French. When I go out from my home, my, my house, I don't feel home. But when I'm inside home, <laughs> I feel very much home. It's so great that you're surrounded by nature. Are there, mm -hmm. Do you see people when you leave? Is there, what's the situation there compared to when you were in New York? Yeah, but New York, you can still see the people around because it's in nature of New York, there are more people. Of course, it's much less. But here, really, uh, I couldn't see anybody. Normally, this place is very well known for tourism destination. Per year, almost 2,700,000 people are coming this small town because it's medieval, very beautiful old town. And uh, these days, there's nobody. When I'm working, there's nobody. All shops are closed, nothing, yeah. And are you feeling okay with your privacy and being with all your wonderful plants and animals, um, how, are you, how are you doing? Oh, it's uh, very fine. I, when I come back here, I immediately start doing artwork, repetitive, like a collage. So I, I wanted to get used to get into immediately my uh, usual life here. So I did so fast some one work. I finished it in three days. Today was relaxing, yeah. Sounds great very productive, so it must be very comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. um, perfect segue to start discussing your artwork. So mm -hmm. before we look at anything, because um, we have some wonderful pieces that I'm excited that we're going to be able to share with everyone, um, I thought we might just take a moment to discuss your material and your process so that the people who may have ne not seen your works before can better understand how you work. Do you yeah. mind talking a little bit about that? Yes, uh, because when I, I was in university in Korea, in the first two years, you just learn all kinds of techniques. In the third year, you have to choose your main, main subject. And then if they divide it for sculpture or oil painting or then, um, so-called it oriental painting is asian painting which used the inks what i'm doing now and on there are printings so uh, i have to choose my object my subject and i decided to do with the paperwork is asian painting with the paper in somehow I, my father has uh, some printing company and she make a, he make a book for the government 
at the time there was not like a computer and uh, everything and also they, they wrote in the um, silk screens and they make a book and the, once they make a book they cut out the uh, uh, book make a um, precisely and then they always remain the, the papers which they have to throw away i took all the time this paper make a fun and uh, so somehow i choose my material which i was used to play with when i was young and then um, when i finish my university and i do again for the my uh, master for the more theory of asian art and the story of Asian art. And then I came to the Milano and Academia of Brera. It was 92, 93, it's starting. It was very much fashionable at the moment. They start to video art and also a lot of photography. And the whole my class was people are interested on this uh, material. But I felt like uh, I was never be good with the machine, especially like a photo and even more video, it seems impossible and then but all my colleagues they do you feel quite you are cutting out but i thought about what can i do i have come here till italy to do something and then i decide just to, to doing what i've done before so i bought a lot of uh, the rice paper from korea i started doing um, ink paintings but uh, this time it's not as a calligraphy but as a form of uh, expression of abstraction um, gesture and it, then it's going on and on i always use the paper so uh, i just wanted to interrupt for a second because i wanted to clarify because i feel very that this is a very important point that um uh it's first of all a fantastic story minjong that even as a little girl you were playing with paper as a, a as a toy. I mean, your father brought home paper and that's what you were absorbed with and what you were fascinated by. But I mm -hmm. think your choice of paper is a really interesting choice. Um, is It's hanji paper, is that right? Yes. Um, so hanji paper, for those of you who don't know, and this is where, Nick, all of your amazing notes and uh, little information that you always text everybody is so important. Um, hanji, pa hanji paper is made from the inner bark of the mulberry tree, but most importantly, it's from a Korean mulberry tree. Yes, yeah. It's like a wine. All in, in Asia, the China, they make a mulberry paper paper in Korea, also Japan, depends on the mulberry's character, the paper changes because basically simply they took uh, the um, uh, the inside of the mulberry trees and the uh, fiber and they, how to say, they, they make a, uh, chopped this uh, fiber and uh, with the water and with a little bit of glue lightly and they fix up with a big, uh, big form of the way you are making paper, no? make a drying up. And uh, this paper, this rice paper has a, a very, very many, many good aspects. First of all, the paper is even more stronger than canvas because the paper has uh, the PRK9, which means they are not easily oxidating, oxidating. Uh, meanwhile, like a paper we are using is a PRK4. You just leave it some drawing. They all became uh, yellowish and they change it because it's a uh, oxid. But the uh, mulberry paper is character is alkali. So it's a very um, a stronger one. Even they are thin like a transparent. And also de depends on the this uh, fiber is how to distribute. When you paint ink, you can see that they are differently absorbing. It's a material which they give their own voice. So if I paint, it depends on the character of the paper, it became different uh, absorbment, different color, different uh, uh, shine, shininess of this. So it's, I really like a paper more than ink or more than brush, more than gesture. The paper is like a earth that they are absorbing, but they decide until where they could absorbing and uh, 
it's so interesting. And each time they make a, pa a paper, it's always different because one year was more dry, one year was more rain. So like a wine, no? sometimes you have a better paper. But to knowing this, you have to use a lot of papers. So you know when you drop the water, how they absorb it, you could imagine what kind of painting you can do, what, um, what else you could use this one. Huh? So um, I, am, I know you are a master in, in paper and especially this paper. And so I had to do a little bit of research. So I actually reached out to your sister who's a conservationist and she was explaining about the strength of the paper and also that you use animal hide or different glue to um, paste different layers together to give it that extra strength. Um, although it's already, it's a different quality and type of the fibrous paper that we're used to in the West you actually reinforce it and give it even more strength. Um, so that you mentioned that it was like um, something growing out of the earth. The tree is something growing out of the earth, like wine. It's yeah. And it's, uh, it has a, a character to it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's really something interesting. I think the viewers, Catherine, are the viewers seeing our first install shot of um, Min Jung's works? Okay, so I thought that it was really interesting when I first walked in to see these works, Min Jung, because initially when you think of paper, you don't really think of works that are this format and this size. Um, mm -hmm. Is this something that you thought of while you were doing these works that um, given the strength of the materials and your love of the, of the paper, that this is something that you wanted to try to mm -hmm. make size um, works? Or is no, normally you know? there's a Korean the master. Of course, now they are all old gentlemen and uh, uh, they normally has a two format. One, uh, the inch, I don't know, 70 centimeters and 140 centimeters is very normal size. And then the biggest one could be 150 centimeter for 200 centimeter. And so normally I use it full, full paper that size. Sometimes I cut different format, but it is good enough to express what you want to do with this paper. But I cannot make a big painting like a two meter, three meter with a paper, or either I have to glue it together. But some paintings you can see this transparency of the joint part, so it's difficult. If I do, Maybe in the collage work, maybe I could make a two, three meters of works. But in general, that uh, I used the size of the um, show in Hill Foundation was like uh, 150 to two meters, which now you are seeing these two, these paintings. So just to clarify, everybody may, else may understand, but I'm not sure if I do, that these are the standard sizes that, um, these, the paper comes from your purveyor, that this is sort of... Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. I buy from the paper shop where they sell only especially this kind of paper in Korea. And uh, unluckily, it's a very hard job. So no more young people doing this work. So when these old masters are dying, I'm not sure how it will go and also the business are very narrow because not many people using this paper so i don't know it could be a material which has a end of story hope not but now as asian people they start to look at their own material as a ink and papers so maybe hopefully it they produce more and again it keeps to do so um Moving forward away from the paper, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the other materials you use, the ink perhaps? Um, yes, yeah, ink is a, another like ink and paper, is, they are like a couple. And the ink is made by the smoke of the trees. So basically the, you burn the trees and uh, you put something, uh, panels on top and the smoke goes on this panel. So the more, uh, the more far away uh, 
where the far away they come smoke is a more better quality. If you put to the, this panel too near the um, uh, burning, it's, it's a bad quality. Bad quality means they don't have a smooth uh, ex expansion when you use in the paper. So also, uh, that's why the ink looks all black, but depends on the tree. If you burn like a, a pine tree, you have a more uh, brownish black and some special tree has a more little bit of a bluish. So these are um, in China already for a long time, they, they divided this. Tongmu means the blue, blue ink and uh, another ink has uh, some different, but it's only slightly, you don't see it. it's only with the expert eyes, you can see the ink color has a different tone. So Minjung, it sounds like you are not only using traditional forms of paper, but the preparation and the type of process that you're using for the ink too is something that is um, very classic yeah. and traditional as well. Mm -hmm. And the ink has a, the difference of the black color, uh, black color, water color. Uh, ink could make so-called 100, 112 degrade of the uh, gray, which is very difficult with the normal black, uh, black water color because of their smokes. So you can really have uh, so many grade of the gray color. So before we move on a little more to talk about process, and um, we see some pictures here from the Hill Fa Art Foundation again, which is slightly different in process from the initial works in that they're collage and torn paper and have probably some singed burning process to them too. I wanted to ask you, Min Jung, in your studies initially in Korea um, and as growing, growing up, whose works did you look at and what types of things influenced you from a young age um, before you went to um, university in Seoul and while you were at university? Did you have mentors or other artists that you were able to discuss your works and these yeah. beautiful materials? When I, yeah, when I was young, I grown up this small city in Gwangju, where it was very well known for the where they keep a lot of traditions. So normally gentlemen, everybody can almost, they can write the calligraphy and there was a still very traditional like bamboo paintings and uh, some chrysanthemum paintings or landscape, but normally you can see this old uh, Chinese painting. So I was sending this special private school where you learn calligraphy and this kind of old style, the, uh, the Asian masters paintings. Basically, you are starting copy of these old masters. And at that time, I thought about artists all that. And then after you go to university, before you go to university, there is exam for the watercolor painting. So I did many, many years for the watercolor painting together with the ink. And then, uh, of course, in the university, you start uh, approaching the Western art. It was quite a confusion because it was so different for me at that time. And uh, I liked, but all the masters immediately as a Western art, like uh, Botticelli and Piero della Francesca, and uh, of course, Leonardo da Vinci, Raffaello, those uh, Western artists was also in my mind. Well, I th we can talk about that when we move on to your and your career and how you have an encyclopedic knowledge of um, Western art, especially starting with your studies in Milan. But I'm going to perhaps reveal my ignorance in old master Asian artists. But I, I'm not sure, Min Jung, is it right that some of these artists um, who are several hundreds of you, that these works are not necessarily attributed, that these are works that are just known by certain masters at a certain time in a certain place, but not necessarily um, have their names as recognized as Leonardo or Michelangelo and Botticelli. Uh -huh. So you mean that uh, the old masters, it's uh, as a uh, Asian? Yes, the old masters, yes. Asian old masters. Yeah. 
Yes, it's a JPEG, so Huang Kong Mang, and of course, all Chinese names, so it's uh, maybe not useless to, to uh, comment them. But they are uh, in China, there is uh, also in Korea, there is a uh, two type. One type is like uh, their scholars, they write the letters and calligraphies after the increase remain. With this, they dilute with the water, they paint flowers on landscapes. They are not professional painters, but they are more uh, scholars they do. And another part, there are really professionals where they do painting, colorful ones and uh, decorative or flowers, very different way for mostly for decoration. So they divided two types of the uh, painting group, the artist, but they give the more important importance for the these scholar groups that who did this very free, uh, free mind and one can see their own character. But when the other professionals they do was very much standard, of course, they are more skillful, and there are two types of old uh, paintings in China. That's also the same in Korea, too. Thank you. Thank you for that um, information and educating um, all of us. So, and then I wanted to talk about how you did move on to Milan and look at a lot of Western and ex the Western art canon experience and, ex and, yeah. and study that. Did you have much exposure to Western art previously to going to Europe or how much ex or how much exposure did you have to the Western canon? Well, in the university, you have uh, all uh, your school teaches you all the Western art histories. So you have a vast um, knowledge of what is happened from the antiquities and you learn until uh, Picasso, what is um, our contemporary. So when I went, when I came to Italy and uh, instead of, I was, of course I was interesting about um, contemporary art history, modern art history, but I also wanted to see the Western artists who got influence from Eastern also. So where it could be, how they accept to, um, to using their own techniques influenced by the Eastern art. And then of course, it uh, is 19th century, mostly they look at like from Van Gogh and uh, so many other artists that they, they look from um, mostly from Japanese art, and uh, they, they got the uh, influence from uh, Eastern, and uh, the result was they simplify much more, no? And it's not realistic, very hardly realistic, but no more, but they make a very simply, simplify more somehow decoratively and uh, more fine they've done. So I was watching for, what they get from us and uh, what was good for them, why they were interested. So I was both sides to look at. And then of course, uh, especially um, the contemporary American artists like uh, Franz Klein, and um, when they used the, using the brushes and similar like um, in Easterns, and I looked look them and uh, I was asking myself, Min Jung, what would you like to be with your own material, your own individual things? And then, uh, then I was not that much forced myself, what shall I do for being different? And uh, it's very naturally I was using ink and always papers and certain point it was more contemporary paintings was my mountain. Basically, the mountain painting was done in the South Sicily, where I went for two weeks to get so some. Before we move on to the individual works, I just wanted yeah. to say that you had made so many, so many interesting comments just now. Um, mm. One thing that strikes me is that you are, you were able to, you mentioned that it was a two-way street. It wasn't just you're looking at Western artists and how they were influenced by Eastern artists, but that you were trying to figure out a way to, to find a, um, 
combination or a, a language that would combine the two that was just not pieces of this and influences here or there that you're finding your own language from both both east and west artistic influences and before we go and move on to the specific works min jung just mentioned some beautiful works we're about to see closer up in in close up um, I just wanted to say the install shots, just in case we hadn't mentioned, I think we did, are from the Hill Art Foundation, where Min Jung's solo retrospective now hangs, sadly, without the attendance that it certainly would have had in typical times. Um, unfortunately, I think your show was up all of maybe two and a half weeks before the Hill Art Foundation, at, along with all the other institutions, had to close its doors. But um, so this is a great way that I'm so happy and excited that everybody's gonna get a chance to see your show, which was uh, largely a retrospective of how many decades of works, Min Jung? Uh, I think it's in 38 or 40 works. And uh, very luckily the show will uh, postpone until maybe end of the year. So after the lockdown is finished, still people can have a chance to see. That's great news. Terrific. Yeah, terrific. So um, just before we move on to the individual works, how was it for you to do this amazing show, which looks perfect in the Hill Art Foundation space? The architecture, the light um, just seem to be perfectly suited for your works. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I know you had Boon Hui Tan, the director of the Asia Society Gallery and Museum, um, who curated the show. What was it? How was it to do your first retrospective? Yes, but the, but the Boonie and me, especially Boonie, was very greedy. And Boonie gave me, uh, we, Boonie chose the 50 works. So basically, we brought 50 works in the space. We took it out, took it out, took it out, and then the, the painting remain under the 40. So, but uh, he has a very clear idea and I like to do show when other people decide. And uh, always when I'm doing single painting, single work, it's the finito, then uh, to uh, hanging the painting is another, another mind. So I always scary about to put my own paintings, how to put, how to purpose. But this time as uh, he, he knows my work very well. So he, he chose quite good, good work to show as a retrospective in New York. And uh, the show, show uh, looks out good. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, um... For me, I've seen many of your works, but I thought the show just hung and was beautiful to follow along the different spaces. I think we're looking at a view, Catherine, are we looking at the view of the smaller works? There's a series called The Mountains and we see some red mountains and blue mountains. And it's just amazing how the different format still is so powerful and makes such an impact, um, um, even compared to the larger works. Um, in the lower floor. So, um, Minjung, do you feel ready to move on to the individual works and talk yes. a little bit about your process? Yes, of course. So speaking yeah. of mountains, I think we have a close up of one of your monumental mountain pieces mm -hmm. um, in the show, Mountain 2019. It's hard to tell from looking at it on the computer screen, like so much of the artwork we're seeing these days. So, we really need you to explain how you yeah. do this work. And basically this work I could tell originally how it comes out. And as I told you, I was in, um, in the, not Sicily, where is, uh, near the Napoli, there is a Positano area. So I was staying in the small house just above the uh, cliff of the sea. Oh, okay. So yeah. I, I can hear every day the sounds of tide, you know. So I was thought about, oh my God, this tide is how long they are doing these sounds. And I was like a look back and when the primordial, the world start with the earth and the sea something. And then, okay, how can I paint these sounds of the tide? And I come back to studio. I start to do with um, Oh, just uh, ink color very lightly and like a, a tide comes, you know, 
Then I put second tide come, third tide come. It was for me, it's the sounds of tide. And then um, I, I see this movement of tide. I turn it out. It looks like a mountain. And that idea, I really loved it because you start with the water and the sea and it's the, they, they combine each other. They like a trans, uh, they go to uh, penetrate each other. It's, it looks like a, a mountain. And then, then I decided this is no more sounds of tide. This is mountain. And uh, then um, this is not real mountain. I, there is no mountain like this. But in Korea, we have a kind of a, a very, uh, no, we don't have that high mountains, but kind of colline. So I have uh, this memory of the, um, the Korea near my, my hometown. And I just started the painting and uh, without any, any real scenery, no photos. And it's just the practicing with the ink and water and on the paper. It comes out very serene and uh, I like this work. I feel like uh, one of the most of my major work. And uh, like when I paint this mountain, it's uh, so relaxing, no stressful. You don't feel to make a good or beautiful painting. Like when you uh, play piano, you do like a Baja invention to make uh, your hand very soft, no? For me, like this. So it's uh, always I like to painting and it's not about this series that goes on this year, but it's so lovely when I feel sad, when I feel bored, when I don't know what to do, then I paint mountain painting. So Minjung, just to make the viewers experience this work more fully, this particular work is quite big. It's related back to the dimensions that you gave earlier. Um, 150 centimeters, did you say? Yes, yeah, 150 to two meters. How many feet is that approximately? It's bigger than life size. It's bigger than... Yeah. Can you divide the 2.54? Somebody, know. somebody, can somebody help us? But basically though, it's composed of scraps of paper. Is that right? Like pieces of paper that um, you burn and tear and glue and make into a three-dimensional form that evokes both... The mountain is the only ink painting. This I is see. Okay. Paper. All right, yeah. so I think we have another mountain work that we can show that um, yes. the better. That there are many mountains, different mountains, as I told you. This mountain just come by mood. And, uh, Catherine, is there easy. another one next uh, afterwards? Oh, great, yeah. This is a red mountain, but I, it was not my plan to do red mountain. And uh, some gallery asked me, could you make a red mountain? So I said, I will try if it the transparency could come with a red uh, red watercolor. So uh, it comes out like ink. They have uh, this very uh, clear transparency. And uh, so I did also red mountains. Then some people asked me blue mountains. So I did blue mountains. <laughs> and uh, so, but for me, or color or not color, it's the same gesture, the same technique. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's always clearly mountain. ink in this in this work. Yes, that you great you you use gradation of the ink that you prepare to give the three dimensional yeah. perspective. Yeah. You can go on with the other imagination. Imagine of the mm, How mountain. Can move on to the next one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, this one was quite the recent one. And uh, I wanted to give this uh, mysterious uh, space on the right side. And I leave uh, this emptiness, you know, that's what um, Asian painting, the emptinesses are so important and void. And I just leave some part of this empty, you feel like uh, something mysterious of space, you know? So I like very much this painting too. And how about another work? This is more like a, a very abstract, very just, uh, there is no, no wave. It's just, a, um, yeah, but I think this is not mountain. No, no, this is timeless. 
So this is a different process, isn't it, Mindy? Yes. No, no, no. This is another title, another work. And we can go to explain this work too. The mountain already I explained. And uh, this timeless was, um, I thought about, I do mountains as a painting, but then I think if I cut all the mountain, what it happens? Because you give uh, the feeling of the time, not only paintings. And I thought about to make a very, very um, elaborative work. Basically, this is kind of mountain I painted and I cut each one centimeter stripe and uh, each stripe I burnt it. So the burning edge, you can see very, um, uh, is a black charcoal colors. It's, so then uh, I glued one by one. It's so many um, layers of the stripe, which was cutting um, of the mountain painting. And uh, so I feel like a mountain itself. So always you see the mountain, you feel the time. There was time there for a long time. Huh? And then uh, as also this elaborative to working on this wave also to give um, more time. So the work seems never finished when I glue it. So that I give the title as a timeless, but this is another transform of the mountain. I love the transition, but also to see this work in person and to understand how many of these strips this yeah. work is composed is really, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's really amazing. Yeah. Yeah, just gorgeous. Yeah. This is, looks like a sea, looks like a mountain. So it's, uh, yeah. The paper almost has like an impasto, I don't know, quality of, of thick thickness to it. Mm. And the color gradations, which are different, but are definitely there. Mm -hmm. um, anything, so can we move forward to see more works, to show everybody more works? Yeah. This is the, the phasing series. This is the, this work, you don't see much through this. And uh, there is a three layers of a paper. First, I do a gesture, and then I put another paper more thinner above the uh, painted paper. And I took it out uh, with the incense, take it out the painted part. So these two paper, one painted black uh, gesture, the other one I burnt out. So it's a hole in this paper. And I put together, uh, glue it, and I put another thick paper behind it to fix up. So this is a three layers of paper. And especially this work is like in one work, you have a two different of the emotion, two different of a character of yourself. One, when you do the um, gesture, you are impulsive, you are more fast movement, and you are convincing, and you, it's powerful movement. And second movement, as you look back your past, you make it, take it out that your power has been. So make an empty part and then, but it's so slow because you are, you are getting with the incense, take it out these forms. So it's completely different attitude with the paper and you put together and with their own two different characters existing together with one work. And uh, I like it, this work too. I love this work, yeah. It's very striking and um some somehow really you captures your spirit in a very direct way mm -hmm. um, and it is a bit unusual it's the only uh, let's it, did we have other phasing uh works from this series yeah this is i painted like with um, some um scopa what bloom and then after I took it out, I burned out all and it was very difficult because when once you burn out and the paper was like really 
too, re too reluctant, too moving, it was difficult to, to fix up with a, with a glue. It just you need the patience to follow out on this all the stripe, the, la the line on the paper, yeah. Immediate and powerful. And um, is there another series we're going to look at together? Um, oh, there's another phasing work to look at just, just to compare? Yes, this is also, yeah. How did you get these marks? These marks I was using, I've done in a long time in Taekwondo, the martial art. So with the brush, I took it this ink. I never touched the brush to the paper. It was like you are painting in the air and you're just dancing with the kind of, kind of dancing and you use your pulse and then, then your ink is dropping down and make this very free forms. And then, of course, then after I burnt out with other paper on top and I glued it. So you're actually doing a dance or a martial yes. art uh, yeah, yes. while you're painting. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, Catherine, what, what others? Oh, one more phasing work. Work in the series of phase in this series. Yeah. Oh, that is so, so. It's not nice to look at through this tele telephone. Or I don't know somebody who has a big uh, computer, maybe look at better. But if some, all of you are in New York, I really invite you to. We all have to go. To to go to, yes. We are thrilled that it will be up for a while. It sounds like we will have a good chance. But let's just look. Oh, I'm dying to show everybody the next work, Catherine. Let's move on to the next work. This is oh. a favorite of mine. Um, can you tell us about making this work and how the process? Yeah. This is like, uh, I cut all the pep, uh, the colored paper is, they sell already dyes the colored paper. It's always uh, handy paper, no, mulberry paper. And I cut out like a donuts, donuts form. And then I start to glue from the smaller one on top and top, like um, the colors. And you don't have a plan to do using what color you use it. You have a plan of color, colored paper cut out and the, the, the two sides I burnt, the toners form inside, outside. And uh, you choose the color moment by moment and glue on top. And uh, what I was only concerning that to make a more vivid, more more contrast between colors and darkness. And uh, somehow in the, my lifetime, if I remember, it's most the happiest time ah. in my life. Yeah, then I love it. Yeah, I was so happy, yeah. You burn the middle of the works of paper. So you're calling it, did you call it a colorful donut? There are holes in the middle that you singe and make a hole. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So there, I love the idea that um, there's an oppositional motif of being full of color and energy, but there's yeah. also an emptiness in the middle. Yes. Of these. So that's why I give this title full of emptiness because the, each element of this round form in the, in the middle is empty. So basically I make it all put this small emptiness, it became a fullness. So. Uh, Pieno di Boto is Italian world, you know, full of emptiness, basically. So it's, I know all these works are different um, and they, they are, the, your, your energy, your, the time that the period that you do it, how long do, does this, did this particular work take you to make? <gasps> yeah, the, oh, no, it's a cutting first and then burning and gluing. One walk maybe take one week, but one week means because I became very fast. Because if somebody who really wanted to buy themselves, it took a more time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine you're working sort of full out, nonstop on, on yeah. work. Yeah, when I start to do the, this kind of work, because you should have the same um, mood, no? You have a happy mood, you go on with this mood because then color changes. 
No, I know exactly what you're talking about, especially for your works, because um, I can feel, I have the feeling of that you're sharing in these works. And also I, I'm very, I wonder if you can tell us you're using fire and um, paper and glue. And also I think your breath, you're breathing sort of life into the forms that you're creating in a way. Yeah, because the paper is very thin. So when you are using this small candle, normally I use this candle which make a, a warm the dishes, you know, small, low and very low. And then um, the paper is so thin, they just put the fire, they boom, burn. So you, it's very, it became very basically, you keep the, your breeze keeping and then you burn to finish you throughout your breeze. So keeping the breeze, because breeze means you are, your, your mind also. If you have so many thinking, your breeze stops. So are all. the breezing, breeze shows you your, your status of your anima. And uh, to burning this paper, at a certain point, your breeze became the same breeze as before. So when you start to do this breeze for a long time, you go into the meditative uh, situation without any any strange thinking, any disturb, and you go on like you became a machine, but without thinking. And I like to do this process for myself to make me calm and uh, meditative mind that is so beautifully said um i'm really sort of taken by your process because there's this element of mastery that you're fully aware of what you have to do um you mentioned playing bach as an exercise in, in piano playing so you've mastered sort of all the bach their you know inventions and everything but now that you're letting go at the same time um, as when you create, that there's this feeling of not having so much on your mind, that you're so mastered in, in what you're doing that you can feel free. Yeah. And uh, mainly my work is very simple, simple and repetitive, very much uh, elaborative. And it's not that much difficult paintings. I consider when I see my work, and uh, it's uh, always important that when an artist uh, choose their materials, the material should become uh, their skin. So you have to feel immediately. So um, the vibration of your material has to be very uh, in line with your emotion. Uh, but in my case, I'm continuously to controlling my emotion. And uh, so controlling my emotion being a, uh, with the same status of anima and through the material. So it helps me, the uh, material helps me to having this situation and also to having um, this situation, it's, uh, it's born in this as a so-called artwork. But I think it's not different than any ladies with the sewing and things, you focus on something and uh, uh, I never give that much important thing as uh, my art to being behind this uh, very special philosophy or special theory or special issue. No, it was just make myself in in the calm and uh, transparent uh, mind, having a same breeze, not to be excited, not to be he said. It was a method. It results in so-called art for me. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, are there more works, Catherine, to show everyone? Ah, this is another fantastic piece. Um, yeah, this one was that I read some funny book, Osho, that there are so many kinds of um, meditation. One kind of meditations said that you feel like uh, your your mind goes uh, floating up in your room and suddenly yourself became too big you can fill up yourself in the room so i thought about what if uh, my spirit uh, departure from my body goes on top of the ceiling with one room 
the room how it looks like it, I was imagining. Then uh, I make very funny form of the geometric form of the room because I did not use a computer for the um, perspective. So it comes out very interesting um, geometric form. And then you can see that I, I, I did always this stripe with burnt edge. And it's just a collage. I cut and burn and collage for this form. I love the idea of this, of the random aspects of the control of the and the mastery of your works at the same time there's this oppositional thing where you're not sure how the burning will turn out exactly but you're just experimenting as you make the work um do you feel that you enjoy a certain level of uncertainty or is this so well practiced that it's almost okay whatever happens when you when you I, when i burn yeah uh, because I know so well about when I choose the paper, I know this paper will burn easily, not easily, or you can burn almost to, uh, uh, very um, regularly. So I know that the burning, the stripe of burning is more or less same undulation, and uh, so I can use it all the time and um, more or less, yeah, it's easy for me because I burn, I don't know, tons of paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, Catherine, let's see what else is there. Just show everyone. No, no. Is that it? Oh, good. Okay, great. Um, I know there's, we'll, we will have questions. I, a lot of people I've seen have asked questions. Um, I just also want to ask you though, before we, uh, open the questions up to everybody else um, about your thoughts about being such a female artist in a in a culture in a generation that perhaps shows has other obstacles that we may not fully appreciate in the West. Everybody knows that female artists often get their due or success later in their careers. Um, Judy Chicago has made comments that she doesn't mind having sort of a late um, time for the successes that she's had because it's given her a chance to do her work outside of any external confirmation or expectations. How do you, is there, do you, have you thought about at all what it was like for you to stay a dedicated artist um, as a Korean woman and how that might be different from your male peers and perhaps different even from your Western female artist um, colleagues um, that you have gotten to know. Have you thought about that at all? Well, but may, mainly as I'm a Korean woman and you know, the woman and they are, have a certain duty and everybody certain age like has to marry and I'm married, I have a kid. And I knew that once I have a, Kid, I had a two kids. Each kid, you took two, three years to carrying up them and completely. So I know that my art practice is behind, but life is too long. And uh, when when your 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 circumstance gives you more time for yourself, you keep going on. And if you are too busy, you leave it. But it's a there parallelly that being an artist. If you are an artist, you are all the time an artist. No, so of course that in my case, also many women case, they, they do kids. It is quite a big thing to we devote. And, uh, but if you're really born to be in your blood, being an artist, it doesn't change. It. Also men could say, I have to make a money for my family. And they have a same different, but the problem has, a, all artists has a problem, no? To parallel with your normal life or to produce your artwork and a lot of problems, economics and, and uh, you know, it's, but it's uh, very normal and the uh, artists, they don't stop somehow. And uh, when is uh, success come late or early, is not the main thing that you never consider. Yeah? You consider that when you make uh, um, your own art, which makes you uh, convincing. Eh? That's the most important thing to follow up. Yeah? It 
that's great. Um, and um, it, it, it's reminiscent of something that Peter Brooks said when um, he was asked about the difficulties or sometimes the inspiration or obstacles about acting. And he just encouraged to just do it. You, you don't really question it. You just, it's something in you that you just have to do. So um, it's wonderful to hear that you have that same energy and inspiration. And one last um, video to show everybody um, your work in progress in New York before we move on to questions from our um, viewers, our audience, our Zoom Zoomers. Um, this is, how long ago is this? This is Min Jung in her studio in New York City. Um, Maybe um, 10 days ago, yeah. But 10 days ago. <laughs> after almost two months in your closing in your apartment, and uh, not only me, everybody gets so bored. And I want to do something to kill the, my boredom, boredom. And then I was thinking, okay, this work would be so long time and that so much focusing i need to focus not to think about what is the circumstance because every day was coronavirus corona i wanted to forget this corona and i start to make a burning very uh, with the incense very fine and the black point you know, after you burn and i smoked this point by point catherine can we watch the video because it moves yeah we can see in as she's explaining Like a needle, but it was uh, incense to make up this point. And I wanted the most boring activity, most bored, the most focusing activity to forget about this pandemic situation. <laughs> When you told me about this work, I laughed, but watching it now, it's really quite beautiful and focused and certainly meditative. It reminds me of, um, you know, a meditation of washing dishes or glasses. You sort of are so hypnotized by, by the water and um, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, we, I can't, we can't wait to see that work. Are you working on that still in where you are now? No, you know, before I leave, I finish, of course, I finish it. Great. Too bad we don't have that finished shot. But um, Nick, should we move on? Or um, Sophia, should we move on to questions from everyone? Uh, sure. I'm happy to transition to the questions and answers. But I just want to thank you both for such an incredible conversation. It's uh, really refreshing to consider the sensitivity to material and the intentionality of it all. So um, with that, I would love to start pulling some uh, people from our audience to ask a question. Uh, first, I am going to uh, B. Horiyuchi. Uh, B, I'm going to unmute you now. Hi. Um, I love your work. Um, very sublime. Um, I asked a question about materials. Materials um, are important to your process. Um, is the process with that meditative um, mindset you get into, um, are the materials as important as the process? Um, or, um, it just seems like there's this meditative aspect you get into and by burning things, by the type of paper you use, by using incense, there's almost like a um, almost religious type of aspect to it. Um, like if you go to a, a, a Buddhist ceremony, they use incense and burning. And yeah, um, it, it's how important are the materials versus the process to you? Is it equal it's, or? Is it yeah, because these materials already when you take the white paper you already calm down your own breath because the, the it's not that you want to be but the material gives you takes you calm down huh? like incense and like paper as you are saying and uh, they they control you not you control them which is quite a, a good re reaction with the, what you are you are using eh? yes okay thank you Thank you. 
Uh, so next, I'm actually going to call on our very own Sophia Pedlow because uh, she had a, a similar question, but there's kind of a, a part two to it. So, Sophia, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Um, your use of repetition stays close to the meditative state of Buddhist practice, as we've discussed a bit, which is about emptying any image, any messages in the mind. But your titles also indicate representational content. How do these different viewpoints affect how you approach abstraction? Uh, the, your question is how I approach my work as abstraction? Yes, in terms of how the meditative um, aspects and that Buddhist mindset uh, yeah. interact with the uh, representational titles that I see in some of your works. Yeah. It, you know, when I do title, normally I don't think before to work. And uh, I do work. And after I look at uh, sometimes months or sometimes uh, one week, and you just uh, comes out, the, the artwork gives you, you a title, no? And also that uh, title is always, it comes to your mind, maybe you are emptified your mind, and it comes easily, no? So it's, it's uh, quite uh, awkward because when I do work, and then title is a big trouble <laughs> because it, it's uh, all, the forms are changing, but the uh, method and uh, techniques are same. You are doing the same thing, but you give other name, and then the name gives another aspect for the artwork. So uh, it's an abstraction, kind of a minimal abstraction with lots of uh, elaboration. No? Then, um, yeah, it's, it's more, um, I could say, more difficult to, to give a title, but title is important, you know. And then I also later, oh, I've done good title or sometimes not. Some works are not title, but I know when they come, or sometimes some friend visit, I ask them to give a title. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you. Um, our next question is kind of related to something that was discussed earlier in the conversation. And this is coming from Astrid. So Astrid, I'm going to unmute you now. Hi, Min Jung. Um, oh, hello, Astrid. How are you? This wonderful conversation. Good to thank see you. you. Yeah, thank um, you. I just wanted to ask you, um, I know you have studios in many different cities, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if your art practice and inspiration change when you go from studio to studio. A bit, yes. And uh, especially when I'm in this countryside, mostly very calm, and um, it comes out, new work is here. And as I move to other studio, you are not marry immediately the space. Basically, I practice what you have done, the, your main studio. So I do series of things already. I have done my main studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes in New York, you can have some different, um, different inspiration. But as I told you, mainly, and as the new space does not give me full feeling or full um, um, creative mind, it's more excited and uh, I need the time for calm. So I do practice, which I have done before, something like that, yeah. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. Um, next, I'm going to go to our dear friend from upstate, Raymond Foy. Oh, Raymond. Min Yang, how are you? Oh, hey, Raymond, I'm fine. It's to great to see you. you. And Me I have too. so many wonderful memories of being in St. Paul de Vence with you. In your, oh. studio, your home. And my question was, what was it like when you were a student in Italy? Who were the contemporary artists you were looking at in Italy? And um, in what way were you trying to figure out how to make this balance between tradition and innovation that you have managed in your work and that I think most Italian artists have to find a way of negotiating because tradition is so heavy in that country. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's true. So when I was in Italy, I was impressed by Puri and the Fontana. Mm. And uh, so mainly Fontana gives me a lot of uh, inspiration as he does like uh, 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 the um, space, no? He cut out the paper, go to the space. It gives kind of a big uh, apertura, the openness. And uh, so I was uh, thinking, how can I be like a Fontana? I remember when I was a student, I was quite focused on Fontana and also Buri because he was burning the sacco on those things. And uh, I think they gave me a lot of uh, inspiration. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good and to see you. Good to see. Hope you come again some more. I will. I will. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Raymond. Um, next, I want to go to a question from our own John Capetta. So, John, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes. Hi. Sorry, I'm trying to get my video started. How do I do that? There we go. Hi, Minjun. Thank you so much for this lovely conversation, and Helen, thank you for the for interviewing. Um, my question has to do with um, the tension between like order and chance. Um, Minjun, your process involves a lot of like really time intensive um, preparation and like precision. And I guess I I wanted to ask just about kind of the moment where you release the process up to randomness, like when you're working with fire, when you're folding the like small pieces of glued paper, um, how you decide when the right time to like open it up. Um, to, to chances and, and what role that plays in your, your practice. Yeah. Uh, to talk about like uh, my burning paper, basically the, the air around the paper with the uh, candle and uh, there are some windy, not windy, but you know, air is always moving. So themselves already very randomly, they do by their own. So I do not uh, force to do something to make something more or less no. I just uh, want to keep it mostly, they should uh, burn the same, like uh, just a black flat line, but by the nature of the air, never be like this. It became uh, automatically randomness, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So uh, next, I am going to give the virtual mic to Olivier. Olivier, I am unmuting you now. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, Olivier. Oh. Hi, Ming Chong. How are you? Hi, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this wonderful uh, conversation. Thank you to Helen and to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail. Uh, more of an observation, a comment than a question, but it strikes me uh, one of the other um, speakers talked about uh, your sense of place and your various studios and uh, there you are in saint paul de vence and um, uh, you create these large works uh, with paper and you're cutting paper you're basically drawing with paper and you're using color and it so happens that just uh, next to you there is the wonderful chapel in vence by matisse and oh, yes. uh, Matisse created the chapel in the early 50s, about two or three okay. years before he died, um, in order to find a sense of repose and meditation. And that is really at the end of his, uh, of his life what he was uh, looking for. He wanted to give uh, uh, that sense of uh, serenity, uh, something which is actually quite oriental in, in a way uh, through this work. And so I was simply asking since your practice switches back and forth between uh, different uh, varieties different kinds and also uh, somehow related to place um, is the fact that you have matisse in your vicinity does that in some respect uh, um, influence your work when you're in the south of france thank you so yes. much yes this uh, matisse uh, his color he's free freely using the uh, the brushes and his lines and he's, uh, I think he was the most free person to do, uh, create his own work. And also the um, chapel, you feel like a, 
he does not put that I make a beautiful, he has no any intention just to fluid to make it his own art. Maybe it's this weather is always not uh, violent and in a peaceful circumstance, they could make it this kind of work. Yeah, great artist. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for your excellent questions. Uh, just a quick shout out to Philip Ellis Foster in the audience who kind of asked a very similar question to Olivier. So thank you, Philip. Um, there, unfortunately, we're, uh, we've kind of run out of time. So there are a couple of questions we didn't get to, but we thank all of you for sending them in. And hopefully we can, moving forward, figure a way out to kind of, you know, these questions in a follow-up yes. way. Yeah. Yes. Somehow we uh, are all connected by Instagram and everything, and uh, um, I don't see much people because I don't want to, to see because I could be so emotional. But uh, thank you so much for the um, all of you to come to listen my humble talk. I was so worried about what I could talk. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And again, I just want to let everyone know that uh, Min Young's uh, exhibition at the uh, Hill Art Foundation will review, so there will be chance to see it again. But to uh, round off the end of our day, it is a tradition here at the rail, at the end of our lunches, that one of our uh, teammates reads a poem. And today, uh, our very own Claudio will be reading a poem. So Claudio, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, lovely conversation. I love this, uh, this gathering. It was really, really something special. In fact, I had uh, a previous poem that I prepared, but the more that I heard uh, and the more that I saw the pieces, the more that I thought of another one. So this is called Paraffin Light. It's written by Nagai Yuki. It's translated from, by, from Japanese by Ravi Shankar. My cheeks are kissed by light, soft as dandelion fluff, enveloping me in paraffin paper, thinking of you and you. Sound crumbles like dry leaves. Para, 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 para. Then the distant intimation of weeping. Hara, 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 hara. Rain falling with the aroma of falling light, evanescent disappearing into morning mist. Whenever you flash across my mind, I feel static, electricity spark. You will stay missing from my life and even the sound of our laughing voices will fade in time. But I wrap sepia tone fragments with my palms. Memories echo back like light, crumbling and disappearing. Moisten my dry lips. Let me croon you back to life. For even if we never meet again, I wish you prismatic tender luminosity to each and every one of you. I bequeath blessings of echoing, rice paper thin falling light. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Claudia. You. Thank you, Minto. <laughs> thank, thank you, Pion. Thank you to invite me. <laughs> and thank you, Helen, so much for moderating. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Thank you, Min Jung. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Good to see Jung. you, Helen. Bye, Olivier. Uh, sorry, you're heading out, but um, please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. at the same time. We'll be joined by David Levi Strauss and Emmanuel Aduma for a conversation on a recent book uh, published by David from MIT Press. It should be a very politically engaged conversation and a great way to cap off the week. So thank you all again for joining thank us. You, and thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Min Jung. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Helen. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.